have authority over Satan and he cannot win against us as long as we remain stable. Because I can tell you, no, I cannot preach a message to you that's going to keep trouble off of you. Nobody has a message like that. Jesus said, in the world, you will have tribulation. That's part of it. I'm sorry, but that's part of it. You cannot use your faith. You can never have enough faith to keep every problem away from you. Your faith is not to avoid problems. It's to help you go through it stably. Yeah. Come on now. If the only time you can sing is on the mountaintop, then you don't have the full picture. You need to be able to sing in the valley too. The only time you can praise God is in the promised land. You got a problem. You need to praise him in the wilderness. And actually, if you don't praise God in the wilderness, you'll never get to the promised land. You got to do the right thing when it's hard to do. You have to do the right thing when you don't feel like doing it. And that's when you grow. These are the battles you fight at home in your midnight hour behind closed doors when it's just down to you and God. We can't live in church. We can't live in the Bible study. We can't live in the praise and worship sessions. There's times when we all have to face our own Goliath. And you got to defeat him. Moses told the people, now first of all, you got to understand the, the situation the people are in to appreciate this. They had the Red Sea in front of them and the Egyptian army behind them. Talk about being between a rock and a hard place. I think they were. You understand that? They'd been slaves for years. Now here comes Moses, their great deliverer. They'd heard the message of deliverance. They were led out, but the enemy chased them. They had the Red Sea in front of them. It's obvious God wasn't making it easy. He wanted to show his power to them by dividing that Red Sea for them. Many times the situations that come in your life, God only allows them so he can show you his power in delivering you. That's how your faith grows and builds as you wait on God and you see him do the God things that only God can do. Amen. It starts with little things and it grows to bigger and bigger things. The Red Sea in front of them, the Egyptian army behind them. Now Moses says, fear not. <laughs> Stand still, firm, confident, undismayed, and see the salvation of the Lord which he will work for you today. For the Egyptians you have seen today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you. Now watch this. The Lord will fight for you and you shall what? Hold your peace and remain at rest. So that's your part in every battle. This is God's battle plan. No matter what happens, you hold your peace, remain at rest, keep doing what you know to do. Ephesians 6 says, having done all the crisis demands, stand firmly in your place. If there's something that you can do, of course, do it. But when you know that you know that there's nothing you can do, then you just need to hold your peace, stay in rest, and keep saying, God is fighting for me. God is fighting for me. Every time the devil says to you, nothing's happening, you say, you're a liar. God is fighting for me. Right now, God is working and I will see what he's doing at just the right time. He may not be early, but he won't be late. You better start talking back to the devil and not let him do all the talking. Second Chronicles 20 and verse 15. He said, hearken all Judah and inhabitants of Jerusalem and you King Jehoshaphat. The Lord says this to you. Now they were in a big battle also. Battles, battles. How many of you are in a battle right now in your own life? All right. Hearken all Judah, you inhabitants of Jerusalem, and King Jehoshaphat, the Lord says this to you, be not afraid. Isn't that amazing? That's the first thing God always tells us. Fear not. And by the way, fear not doesn't mean don't feel fear. It means when you feel fear, don't run. Fear means to take flight and run away. So every time you see God say, fear not, he's not talking about the feeling you have. He's talking about the action that we normally take when we're afraid. If people are afraid of something, then they start to back away from it. But he says, no, stand your ground, fear not. Keep going forward and do what I'm telling you to do. So that's just a little off the side lesson on fear. 
Hearken all Judah, you inhabitants of Jerusalem, King Jehoshaphat, the Lord says this to you, be not afraid or dismayed at this great multitude. Oh, hallelujah. For the battle is not yours, but God's. Wow. The battle is not yours, but God's. Do you know that you can trust God to fight your battles while you go ahead and enjoy your life? So many people think if they've got a problem that they're kind of obligated to be miserable till the problem is solved. No, God sits in the heavens and laughs at his enemy. Why? Because he's already seen the end before the beginning. All right, let's go ahead with this. Tomorrow go down to them. Now he's giving them instructions. And behold, they will come up by the ascent of Ziz. And you will find them at the end of the ravine before the wilderness of Jerel. You shall not need to fight in this battle. <laughs> Take your position. Stand still. <laughs> See the deliverance of the Lord who is with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord is with you. Now, all the time he's saying, hold your peace, hold your peace, hold your peace, hold your peace. This is not your battle. It's my battle. Now, watch what happens. And Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground. So what was his position? One of prayer. God, I put my trust in you. I lean on you, God. I rely on you. I'm not going to move in the flesh. I'm not going to give up my joy. I believe, God, that you're working right now. So he got on his knees and he began to pray. Now watch. Jehoshaphat bowed his head with his face to the ground and all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell down before the Lord worshiping him. Some of the Levites and the Kohathites and the Koharites stood up to praise the Lord, the God of Israel, with a very loud voice. I'll tell you, if you can get everybody praising God, mm -mm, the devil's days are over. This goes on and on and on. Let's look at verse 21. And when he had consulted with the people, he appointed singers to sing and praise him in their holy priestly garments. You know what? You should tell your family when you're in a battle is I'm going to go in here and pray and I want the rest of you to sing. And they went out before the army saying, in the midst of the battle, and this, they're not saying, oh my God, what are we going to do? I don't know what we're going to do. <laughs> what are we going to do? I don't know what to do. This is what they were saying. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good and his mercy endures forever. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good and his mercy endures forever. And Jehoshaphat's down on his face. He's saying, oh, thank you, God, that you're delivering us. We thank you, God, that you're delivering us. We know that you're on our side, God. The battle is not ours, but it's yours. And then everybody else, oh, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. Now watch what happens. And when they began to sing and praise, the Lord. So when we do what we're supposed to do, not what we're not supposed to do, the Lord goes to work. The Lord said ambushments against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir who had come against Judah, and they were self-slaughtered. You know what that means? They got so confused. The enemy got so confused. It confuses the devil when he throws his best shot at you and all you'll do is praise and sing and worship and trust God. And they got so confused they killed each other. What a story. I've gotten to the point where I'm just like, wear yourself out. Been there, done that. Sometimes I wonder what it's going to take for the devil to get it that I'm not going to give up. He just still doesn't seem to understand that. One last scripture I want us to look at, John 14, 27. Or well, at least one last one in this realm. Jesus, before his ascension, he had done everything he could do. He'd lived, he'd taught, he died, he was resurrected. He's ready for his ascension. Now he's going to leave a legacy. Watch this. Peace I leave with you. My own peace I now give and bequeath unto you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Now here comes our instruction. Do not let your hearts be troubled. 
Neither let them be afraid. Stop allowing yourselves to be agitated and disturbed and do not permit yourselves to be fearful and intimidated and cowardly and unsettled. You ought to act better than that. Jesus is saying, look, I've given you my peace. It's in you. Now what are you going to do with it? Are you going to let your emotions rule? Or are you going to use that self-control prompted and led by the Holy Spirit? Are you going to let him strengthen you to stay calm, to believe that God's in control, and to act like you really believe what you say you believe? Everybody say, I have peace. You know, back to Peter again. Let's go to Matthew 26, verse 51. Peter was so, he vacillated. He was just like a spiritual giant one second and an emotional mess the next. But that's okay. We all start there, I think. I started there. It's not, it's not even bad news if that's where you're at today. The only thing I'm trying to get you to do is realize that you can't stay there. I can't change this overnight and you can't either. The point is, is you just need to start making progress. If you've improved a year from now, that's good. It may take 10 years. I don't care how long it takes. As long as you end up being stable and the kind of person that God can really work through and depend on. I've already told you, I was a big mess, an emotional mess. But God changed me. It wasn't easy, but it was worth it. Peter was an emotional, volatile man. Always had his mouth going. Did some really silly things, but yet he changed. Matthew 26, 51. And behold, one of those who were with Jesus, this is in the Garden of Gethsemane, reached out his hand and drew his sword, and striking the body servant of the high priest, he cut off his ear. <laughs> There's Peter again. <laughs> totally emotional. Completely emotional. Jesus had prayed through. He had sweated great drops of blood. He had suffered through the thing mentally and emotionally. He wasn't going to run. He was going to do the will of God. Now here comes Judas. He gives Jesus the Judas kiss. Here comes the high priest servant. They're going to take Jesus back to the city to be beaten and crucified. Peter, totally emotional. I'm not putting up with this. I know Peter because I'm just like that. <laughs> but I've changed. Hallelujah. At least most of the time. <laughs> now let's keep looking at these verses. Then Jesus said to him, put your sword back into its place for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. Now this is the part I love. Do you suppose that I cannot appeal to my father and he will immediately provide me with more than 12 legions, more than 80,000 angels? I mean, Peter, do you really think I need you to cut off the guy's ear? I mean, if I did not want to go through this, all I'd have to do would be call 80,000 angels and I could be delivered just like that. Now watch. But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled? That it must happen this way. The point is, is Jesus was saying, look, Peter, this is what I have to do. He'd already gone through the whole thing in the garden. I don't want to do this. If you can deliver me, deliver me. But your will be done and not mine. I'll drink the cup if you can't take the cup away from me. You know, we got to fight through in prayer sometimes to get to the will of God. I'm not saying it's easy to do things you don't want to do. I'm not saying it's easy to forgive people who have hurt you. I'm not saying it's easy to keep your mouth shut when you want to tell somebody off. I'm not saying that it's easy to hold your peace. I'm not saying any of it's easy, but I am saying it's doable. And just like Jesus battled through in the Garden of Gethsemane so the will of God could be done through him, we need to battle through these emotions and wrong mindsets so the will of God can be done through us. I battled through the stuff that I battled through so I could fulfill the call of God on my life. And because of that, you can be helped today. Now, there's somebody else that you need to help. And if you don't let God do what he wants to do in you, you're not going to be able to help them either. Come on.
As I said earlier, the most dangerous negative emotion is the emotion of anger. Moses was an angry man. He loved God, but he had a temper that never got dealt with. No matter how much you love God, if you've got a bad temper, just stop saying it's just a family bloodline thing. <laughs> now, you know, some people are really angry and they don't even know why they're angry. So you need to find out why you feel the way you feel. <laughs> Maybe you're angry because you have unresolved issues in your past. Deadly emotions buried alive never die. They just sit in there and eat away at you. So many people have dysfunctional behavior today because there's something buried in them that they've never, ever dealt with. I had to deal with a lot of stuff. My dad sexually abused me for about 15 years. My mother didn't know how to help me, so she didn't. She pretended like it wasn't happening. It ended up hurting her as well as me and everybody else. And I had a lot of problems from that, a lot of problems. And I didn't understand myself. I didn't understand why I behaved the way I behaved. I didn't understand why people responded to me the way they did. I really didn't understand. But God will teach you if you'll let him. And if you even begin to say, okay, God, I feel angry all the time. What is my problem? Like my youngest daughter, she had a problem with anger. And it wasn't other people that she was angry at, but she would constantly get angry at herself when she didn't perform the way that she wanted to perform. And the bottom line is, is she finally had to face that she was getting her worth and value out of what she did, not who she was. And she would tell you this as she was standing here. She gives me permission to share things like this if it'll help somebody else. Our whole family is pretty much that way. If our mess can become your miracle, then have it. <laughs> Amen. I've decided to let my mess be my message and maybe it'll be your miracle. You got to know truth in your heart. You can't just stuff all these things. So angry people, many times there's a root to this anger. And I don't know exactly what the root of Moses' anger was, but I know that he never really got it dealt with. When Moses went up and got the Ten Commandments and he came down and saw that the people were worshiping a golden calf, he got emotional and he threw those commandments that God had written with his own finger on the ground and broke them. <gasps> He was so emotional that he just didn't even think what he was doing. He spent 40 days getting those. And now he let the misbehavior of a group of people cause him to have to go back and spend another 40 days doing it all over again. How many times do we just make the mess worse by getting mad about what's going on? Come on, we ramp it up to a whole nother level, don't we? If we just stay peaceful and calm, God would give us answers and lead us and guide us. And then there was a time when Moses was out in the wilderness with the Israelites and they were thirsty and they wanted water. And they began to murmur, grumble and complain and blame Moses. I tell you, I don't know how the man put up with them for 40 years. I really don't. I would have lasted about a day. It's like, look. I left the palace to come and get you guys out of here. Now I'd at least like to see a good attitude. But they were murmuring, grumbling, complaining, we want water, we want water. So God, Moses went to God, they want water, they're going to kill me if they don't get water. And God said to Moses, see that rock? Take your rod, strike the rock, and water will come out of it. Sure enough, that's exactly what happened. And it was a, it was a, it was a natural situation that had a spiritual correlation in the New Testament that when Jesus the rock was struck on the cross, that living water poured out of him, and those who drank of that water would never thirst again. Now, later on, a few months later, I don't know how long it was, same thing happened again. They're at a different rock, and they're thirsty, murmuring, grumbling, complaining. Now, Moses got angry. And when you get angry, you get emotional. Prayed to God, they want water, what am I gonna do? Now, God said, now listen, see, when you're emotionally upset, you don't hear what God says. And God said, tell the rock to give forth water. But Moses went and struck it twice, 
which the correlation to that is you can't crucify Christ twice. He's already been crucified. Now you get what you need by praying, calling it forth, telling it to come. He said, now you tell the rock to give forth water. And instead he struck it twice. And God said, because you have not believed me to do what I told you to do, because you have not honored me before the Israelites, you shall not lead them into the promised land. What? I put up with them 40 years and now we're right on the edge and I don't get to go in? I mean, I have to tell you, I had a little conversation with God about that. I'm like, hey. I mean, you know, leaders can't be perfect. But here's what God told me. To whom much is given, much is required. Moses had the honor of leading those people out of slavery in Egypt, through the wilderness, taking that rod of his and having God work through it to do mighty, unbelievable miracles. When he touched that Red Sea, it parted. So many great things Moses got to be involved in. Let me tell you something. When God shows you great things and he speaks great things to you and he gives you great revelation and he uses you and he does great things for your family, it's not all about you just being excited about what he's done. There comes a great responsibility with that. To whom much is given, much is required. And not only that, there's a responsibility for knowledge. Just by virtue of the fact that you came here today, you now have more responsibility than you did when you walked in because now you know something you didn't know when you came in. So now you are more responsible than ever to manage your emotions because now, in no uncertain terms, you know better. I tell people all the time, you may not like everything I say, but you won't be confused when you leave. I am saying we must manage our emotions and stop letting them manage us. And at least when you fly off the handle and get emotional, realize it's a sin and repent. Don't just ignore it and act like that's an okay thing to do because you just got a bad temper. I see all you people way up there in the balcony. Don't think I'm ignoring you. And I see all of you behind those television sets at home too and behind that computer I'm talking to you too. Not just the people in this room. I'm talking to all of you everywhere. Manage your emotions and don't let them manage you. We've got to be stable. Amen? All right. I've got a list of scriptures. We're going to put them up here one right after the other on the screen. And then we're going to close. I want you to see these for yourself. Beginning in Proverbs 37, 8. Please just look at the screens. And see these. Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Fret not yourself. It tends only to evil doing. Every time you don't manage your emotions, you're going to get in trouble. He who is slow to anger has great understanding, but he who is hasty of spirit exposes and exalts his folly. He who is slow to anger is better than the mighty. He who rules, rules his own spirit is greater than he who takes a whole city. Good sense makes a man restrain his anger, and it is his glory to overlook a transgression or an offense. Make no friendships with a man given to anger. Uh-oh. And with a wrathful man, do not even associate. A man of wrath stirs up strife, and a man given to anger commits and causes much transgression. When you're angry, do not sin. Do not ever let your wrath, your exasperation, your fear, your indignation last until the sun goes down. Now please notice that God never said don't get angry. Anger is an emotion. If somebody offends you or hurts you or does something wrong to you or to somebody that you love, you are going to feel anger. Just like if you lose something you love, you're going to feel disappointed. If a loved one dies, you're going to feel grief. We can't go through our life and not feel things. I'm not asking you not to feel anything. But we do have to enjoy the good ones, learn how to manage the bad ones. Because if we don't, we're opening a door for the enemy that we do not want to open. <laughs> 